The work I've been doing with Layla has been looking at the archive of the Bell. And the Bell was the last of five convalescent homes that existed in Lansing from 1890 onwards. And what struck me of what Suzanne was saying uh, was that currently in Gilcare Homes, the people there are very old indeed and suffering uh, badly as a consequence, but they're only there for 18 months. So when you think about the homes we're talking about, particularly the Bell, that was much more to do with poverty and, and the hardness of life. People recovered very slowly from illness. And there were other illnesses like TB that don't exist today. There was one home that, that, that was run called the Chestnuts that was for TB patients only. So that's an important thing to bear in mind. The homes we're talking about uh, were for people who, had, who maybe had a, what we consider a minor operation today and would take them weeks or months to recover. Uh, there were also elderly people who felt they couldn't cope, so they were in homes maybe for years. And going back to the uh, Gilcare project that Suzanne mentioned, I remember now that the first home that Gilcare opened, the average age of those first residents was 68. I'd imagine it's more like 88 now, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's a big change. And the other big difference is, of course, organisations like Gilcare are run by professional people. But uh, in its origins, when Suzanne was mentioning Frank Cave, Effie Methold, and also with the Southern Convalescent Homes, they were done by volunteers. And these people often gave not just years, but decades of their life to building up these homes and these charities. So in the short time we've got this evening, um, Layla is going to talk a bit about William Chorley, and he was the founder of the Southern Convalescent Homes. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about Ivy Bulldog, who was associated with the Bell for over 60 years. So I'll pass over to Layla. Okay, so um, Bell Memorial Home, which of course a lot of you will recognise. Um, but I'm going to be, because I'm talking about really pre-1926 when Bell Memorial Home was built, I'm going to be talking more about these four homes that are going to feature a bit, and then talking about William Chorley as well. So um, Bank Cottage was actually the first home that was used, um, not on here, but that was because it was only used for uh, the first year. So the first summer, um, a man called Mr Northcroft let William Chorley, who was the founder of the homes, um, use Bank Cottage, and that was the summer of 1889. And it was successful. It accommodated 10 children at a time um, who were from very poor areas of North East London. The first real home, though, was the Chestnuts, which was opened in 1890, which is up there. Um, and there were some comments we found about people getting a bit confused about the name the Chestnuts because the home actually was called the Maria Wenman home first and that was because it was a Mr Wenman that actually gave um, William Shawley the um, right to use the home. So um, it became known as the Chestnuts though and um, some people were a bit confused by that because of the trees out front and they thought that that was because they were chestnut trees, but of course they weren't chestnut trees, so this, um, this made some people quite perplexed by this. Um, they were actually ilex trees, but yes, the reason it was called the chestnuts, which Chris has mentioned, is because a lot of the patients who went there had chest complaints and they had tuberculosis, so that's why it was called the chestnuts. <laughs> um, and there were also these other homes as well, which um, Channel View, which was opened um, as a, a home for men, talk about in a minute. Um, Mount Hermon, which was opened for aged, aged and dying patients, um, and also uh, Beachville as well. So um, just going to talk a little bit about the research process because we had minute books that went from 1917. So that meant that before all the stuff that happened before that, um, we had to then sort of dig into different archives to find information about. What we did, we used the Bell Archive quite a bit, but we did find that there were discrepancies with it. So there were other things that we needed to use as well. The National Newspaper Archive was incredibly useful. Um, and it was quite good because in some projects, we might just look at maybe the local newspapers. But with this one, we knew that because we had London to deal with as well, and the fact that lots of the things we were looking at was North East London based, uh, the National Newspaper Archive was really useful. And one of the, my favorite things that we found, um, were two adverts 
from 1895 that appeared in the Women's Signal. And um, this is one of them. And this one, um, the writing is quite small. I don't expect anybody to actually be able to read that from where you are, probably. Um, so um, it talks about the suffering poor from some of the most pitiable slum districts of East London. Weary mothers and their enfeebled wee bairns. And it says, the past severe winter, with no work, starvation, scarcely averted, sickness supervening, home nearly sold up, all these and more have left behind a terrible legacy of weakness and weariness of body and mind, making together a condition that is distressing to witness. So the conditions in North East London, North East of the Thames, which kind of encompassed, so Millwall, Stepney, Limehouse, Mile End, Whitechapel, St George's in the East, Spitalfields, Bethnal Green, and Poplar and Shoreditch. Um, so they, they, on the census there were about 600,000 people recorded in 1861 living there, and, and it was estimated that 50,000 of them were living in destitution, and that 15,000 of these were children. And there was a quote I found that said that, um, that these children, many of them were almost naked and starving. Um, so this was the kind of background for these homes being created, was because these people were living in such poverty, um, and there was a drive to get children, I think this lovely little illustration here on this particular advert, out of London and obviously into some fresher air. And I'm going to talk a little bit more when I talk about Chorley about what his motivations might have been for doing that. But first I just want to show you some images we found, so it was also part of the research. Um, is we found some really great collections of postcards. And this kind of gives you a bit more of a flavour about some of the people who were actually in these homes. So this particular one, um, you will see there in the middle, who we are quite confident now, is William Chorley. So he was the founder. And this one was taken at Channel View, this picture, in 1908. Um, and um, some of the other research that we've done has uh, talked a bit more about this Chorley's Bluebirds. So the people who were, and particularly men who were in Channel View for a long time, they wore a kind of a, a navy blue, a rough navy blue uniform, um, and that was known to, they were known to the villagers as Chorley's Bluebirds. Also homers as well, I guess because they were in homes, but possibly so. Um, here's the, um, some of the occupants of the chestnuts from 1909. And that was the chestnuts mainly, take, mainly took in children to start with, um, and then women as well. There's a, a man outside the chestnuts. He may have been convalescing in South Lansing. He, he may have just been somebody who just wanted his picture taken for some reason with the chestnuts in the background. We'll, we'll never know that. Um, and here's another group from the chestnuts as well. So um, I think it says there about how the, the somebody somebody in that postcard was um, was the one that sent it, but we don't know. I don't know which one it was. That is the dining room of the chestnuts, a bit of an interior. And that, this one gives you quite a nice idea about um, in the external look of how we've got on that side there that's marked. So we've got the chestnuts on this side, and then on the other side is, is Mount Hermon as well, where the aged and dying patients were. Um, and, and yeah, you've got, you've got, you can see there a little um, note that was written on the postcard from somebody who was obviously staying at Mount Hermon and they marked it. And there's some ladies that may have been in Mount Hermon. Well, they were in Mount Hermon, but may not have been in that postcard, but some of those. And the residents of Channel View, who are the ones for the Chorley's Bluebirds. And lastly, we have the patients at Beachville. That's the smoking room inside Beachville. And now I want to come along to what really fascinated me about Chorley. So I was sort of thinking he was somebody who was, uh, yeah, certainly a philanthropist, really, really top bloke, created all these wonderful homes, helps all these people. Um, and then I found this story, which just made me so interested in William Chorley that I ended down lots of rabbit holes of research trying to find out more and more about him. So um, this was about um, an incident that happened in 1918. And in the newspapers, bear with me one moment, the newspapers, um, there were titles for this story, like Tale of a Washing Line, and Tore Washing Line Down, and Cut the Clothes Line. 
Um, this was a, a situation that must, must have seemed quite domestic, really, in 1918, when there were much bigger issues going on, um, whereby a clothesline caused a massive disturbance between William Chorley, our founder in the middle there, um, and a neighbour who disputed where the homes were hanging their washing. And she got quite upset about this. It was actually her mother's home, and she thought that this piece of land where the homes were actually hanging all their, their laundry out, their clean laundry, was b belonging to her mother. So in this like sort of little dirty patch that was out the back, she decided that she was going to keep removing the washing line pole and letting all the clothes fall into the dirt. And obviously William Chorley and the laundress who worked there particularly, I'm sure, um, were quite angry about this situation. So it escalated all out of control um, and there was some I kind of the thing is I sort of want to tell you about it but at the same time I want you to read the book so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read you a couple of little extracts um, so that it gives you just a flavour of what might be a story you might want to find out more about so this particular um, extract I'm going to read you is from um, the lady who tore down the washing line so she was called Mary Anisley Keneally and she herself was fascinating. So at this particular time, Shirley is 70 years old and um, Mary Neasley is 45 years old. And she herself has quite an interesting backstory as well about who she might be. Um, and she had some good works behind her name as well, but there were also um, a couple of instances that she were involved, was involved with before this that suggest she might have also been perhaps a bit of a difficult character, maybe, um, and like to think that she was right, just like perhaps Troy did. So um, this was what she said about the incident. Mr. Chorley never tells the truth. He injured me terribly with scissors. He is always brawling like this. Why I heard his voice in the distance with the roar of a bull booming, he said, come out, you beauty, come out, and I will kill you, kill you, kill you. My sister said that if she had a patient in that condition, she would put him in a straitjacket. <laughs> so this is quite, obviously quite different from all the other things that I'd read about William Chorley, which um, obviously really, really intrigued me. And this particular case hit the newspaper because I think it wouldn't have done. The first reports about it, because it ended up in court between these two arguing about this washing line and what had happened and who'd injured who and all these things and who got stabbed with scissors, which you'll have to read the book to decide who you think that might be. Um, but so it was, it, it ended up in court and it had been reported in the local newspaper, which I think is probably the, the most accurate and best sort of um, account of it we have. Because the thing is after that, that it didn't get resolved, and this ca it carried on. She kept, she went and tore the washing line down again. Um, she, well, there was no stopping her, and then she wrote some very nasty letters to people about William Chorley. So what then resulted was a big libel case, and that's when it hit the national newspapers. Um, so yes, to hear the full story, I will leave that up to you, but there was a little kind of nice snippet as well from the court case, which I wanted to share with you. So this is when William Chorley is being cross-examined as part of this libel case. So Mr. Doherty, who is the guy who is doing the cross-examining, he said to Chorley, did not a man named Johnson use a pair of scissors? And Chorley says, no, it was the defendant who used the scissors. She stabbed Johnson with them. Doherty says, I suppose there was a crowd around. And Chorley says, there were a few of the inmates. Doherty, in fact, your boys enjoyed the show. Surely, possibly they did. Boys will be boys. <laughs> There's laughter in the court then. And then Mr. Doherty said, uh, how much have you lost by these libels? And um, Chorley says, indignantly apparently, how much is a man's character worth? <laughs> um, he recorded something slightly different in the minute book, which was to say that actually he didn't think his reputation had been affected in the village. Um, but whichever, we don't know which one of those is actually true, whether he was affected or not, and how much, who knows. But certainly the newspapers painted him in quite a good light. But um, if you want to know why, more about why that is, then you will have to read the book to find out. Um, so I'm just going to briefly, because I realise that I'm going to run out of time and Chris is going to have no time at all, um, 
just another little picture of William Chorley there peering out from behind a group. I'm just going to really briefly tell you why I think maybe Chorley might have been interested in this particular line of work. And I'm going to try and race through it so that um, Chris has time. So Chorley was born in 1948 in Bath. And uh, he was born into a line of tailors. So his father was a tailor, his grandfather was a tailor. Um, and his grandfather, actually, um, he's, he was registered as being born in Chard, and there were more Chorleys in Chard that were tailors as well. Um, and at this particular time, Chorley's father had uh, tailoring in um, business in um, Bath, but also his uncle did, and there was another James Chorley who was probably related to them as well. So it, it was quite a big deal. But would... Surely have gone into being a tailor, maybe he would, but unfortunately his father died when he was only nine years old. So this meant that the family then had to move out of their place of business, um, and, and his mother Mary had to take on some lodgers. So this is the census detail for that. I think it must have been quite an upheaval for Chorley at that time to lose his father just because also his whole, obviously the emotional landscape, but then also his whole entire life, his practical life probably just changed overnight. His mother took on work as a shoe binder, which is quite interesting because shoe binding was a really skilled job and very complicated and you really had to get things absolutely right with shoe binding. So it kind of suggests that somewhere she had some kind of training in that. But then she, she moved the family to London and she may have done this because there was developing work there in shoemaking. That could have been a possibility. Um, it may also have been there was just a lot more opportunity for her family. Um, so uh, as you can see, this, all this deciphering um, with some of this language that, that sort of, uh, particularly the railway servant signalman took me quite a long time to figure out. I had to employ some of my friends to help me stare at that for long periods of time to figure it out. So, um, there's some good things on these censuses where you just have to look at them and <laughs> get a bit clear. So he was in London and um, he then got involved in, um, in possibly through an open air mission maybe. Um, he himself got involved in preaching. He was doing a trade, he was being a shopman, um, brush maker, and then suddenly he's, he's working with the church so, and for the missions. Um, so it may be that he himself got inspired by an open air um, mission himself. This is actually an open air mission in Lansing, it's not in London. So I found that picture and I thought it was quite a good one, so I put that in here. And the other thing that really happened to Chorley that I think may have sort of put it, obviously he, was getting, he got involved in mission work, but I think maybe he was inspired to do this particular kind of work, which was to take these children out of London down to the south coast and give them fresh air. And he was doing, before he set up holiday homes, he was doing that, taking them to places like Southgate just for a day trip. So it was obviously something that really meant a lot to him. And I think it may have been because he lost his brother. Um, his brother was 22, and, but his brother had got consumption. So his brother was obviously probably quite ill with that and unable to breathe and maybe coughing a lot for possibly years. And that may have had a really big impact on Chorley. It, of course it may not have done, but I think it probably did. Um, and I think it may have been why he then was, was felt that, like maybe this was a bit of a personal crusade. Uh, but you will have to, you can read the book and decide for yourself. You know, you might disagree with me, and please do. Um, but that's my thoughts. So um, I think I've got to finish up now. Chris is going to have no time at all. Um, we look for his grave, there it is. <laughs> and there's just uh, two more images I'm just gonna flash up in front of you, which will be in the book, hopefully, so you can see them then. Um, these are during the war years. So we found this fantastic one from uh, during the First World War, which is outside the chestnuts. And this is how we found out that during World War One, the chestnuts was used um, for uh, war wounded soldiers. We didn't know that until we found this image, so that was quite exciting to find. And the last one that I'm gonna leave you with, and Chris is gonna tell you, more about which is the sun beam getting hit by a bomb during World War Two, the sun bomb being being the children's home, which he's going to tell you more about um, now. <laughs> um, I should point out there weren't any children in it at the time, fortunately, because uh, during the Second World War, the homes were requisitioned for the war effort. Uh, so it was empty when it was bombed uh, in 1942. Um, but quite a dramatic picture. 
Um, and uh, very pleased to get the originals. We'd seen photocopies of this photograph, um, but, uh, but not the original. So there's the uh, Bell Memorial Home. Um, so I'm just going to very briefly talk about the, the post-Second World War period. Um, and it's really worth thinking about the welfare state and the fact that what we assume today to be good health care and the expectations of good health didn't exist even within uh, living memory. The, the annual reports um, for the Bell were issued uh, from 1947 up to 1998 and they're almost entirely the work of, of one lady. So that lady, this lady here is uh, Sister Ivy Bulldog. Um, I haven't been able to work out quite what she was a sister of. I don't think it was nursing, I think it was of religion, but she was a Methodist. And I'm not really aware of Methodists having nuns, which you tend to think of as sister, but she's always referred to as Sister Ivy Bulldog. She was born in Bow in London in 1909, and she was involved with the Southern Convalescent Homes from 1938 up to her death in 1998, 60 years uh, of really continued service uh, to the Southern Convalescent Homes and, and the Bell. But if you look at, we look at the um, annual report for 1947, um, the first thing that strikes you is that Methodism is really important to the running of the home. Um, the, the annual report says there is an atmosphere about the home that speaks of sympathy and understanding. The evening prayers have been a time of rich fellowship and communion. And then they go on to talk about some of the children. Um, Elizabeth came to us as a convalescent from suspected TB peritonitis. Her distended stomach was enormous and the child looked top heavy and old. She stayed with us eight weeks and the change was amazing. Her stomach became normal and she was able to join in all the fun and play with the rest. Maria was an acute rickets case, nearly three years old and unable to walk or stand. After 12 weeks of lancing air and good food and splendid care, she was sent home now, walking normally. We count her one of her triumphs. Every child we have had has gained considerably in weight. Um, now there's a couple of the elderly folk in the homes at that time. I think we'd be pretty disturbed if we saw people looking like that. And, I don't know how old they were, but they're probably not as old as you think. They may well have just been in their 70s. Um, come back to him. Um, this is the, the Sunbeam was rebuilt and reopened officially in 1950. And you'll see all the dog collars there a lot of Methodist clergy, and the lady with the beret on is Nancy Price, the famous actress who also wrote, who lived in Worthing at High Salvington and wrote a number of memorable books. Uh, she once spent a year as a tramp going around England, and another time she got herself on board a merchant ship and pretended to be a sailor and wrote all about her experiences, so she was quite a formidable person. Um, now this is the children's home uh, in its last years of operation. And what was very interesting was that um, after the Second World War, uh, the reopening of the children's home was seen as a, a priority. And yet, uh, opened in 1950, closed in late 1956. And why did it close? Well, Ivy Bulldog in her annual report explains. The applications for the children's vacancies in the Sunbeam home have not been as numerous as we would have hoped. I think there are two reasons for this. In the first place, statisticians tell us that the number of children suffering from childish ailments and epidemics has decreased beyond all previous records and children are generally healthier than ever before. In the second place, the medical profession are changing their views about children's convalescence. The modern thought is that to separate a child from its mother for any length of time is definitely detrimental to the child. Um, so there, there are two explanations there, but the first one in a way interests me the most. The huge impact of the National Health Service within a decade had transformed 
the health expectations of children and the general population. And as time goes on, children's home closes, but also the people, the older people, come into the homes, the age gets older, and the reason changes. Instead of them just being there because they're old, they're there because they're ill. Um, and throughout all these decades, you see this, uh, this steady improvement. Um, now, I know I haven't got an awful lot of time, so I might just whiz through a lot of these. Um, this is Akim, uh, one of the last children who stayed at the Sunbeam before it closed. And his parents were Nigerian and they were both studying uh, at university. And so he wasn't there because he was ill, he was there because they didn't feel able to look after him at that time. But they are having their prayers, you see, I said it was all very Methodist based. Uh, ring a ring of roses. Now here's a slightly later photograph of the staff at the bell. And um, there's Sister Ivy Bulldog. There's Harry Leakes, his wife Peggy, and Irene Chapman. Now those four started working at the bell in 1945. Harry until he died in post in 1973. Um, his wife Peggy then took on his role as superintendent, and she ended up as a resident at the Bell. Um, Sister Ivy went through all sorts of different posts uh, at, the, at the Bell. Uh, she kept writing the annual reports, oh dear, I've got to retire, this is my last year. And then two years later, uh, she'd be back in a different role. Um, and Irene Chapman was the matron. Um, the Bell went through a very rough patch in the 1980s. Uh, they had uh, a quick turnover, shall we say, of senior staff. And on these occasions, these three ladies were called back out of retirement to run the whole thing. Um, and you can't really replace that. People who give years and years of dedication without payment can't easily be replaced. Uh, so they, they, the uh, three of them, and including Harry Leakes, really, I think without them, it probably wouldn't have lasted as long as it did. Now, I'm aware of time, and what I wanted to do, and of course I've got far too much information to tell you, um, I wanted to read some of the uh, reports that um, Ivy Bulldog wrote, because some of it gives a fascinating insight into her mindset and the world in which she was living. She liked to comment on national news, and some of this, I thought, might seem interesting uh, for some years on. I'll just end with, 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 the, with two or three quotes that, uh, that might interest you. So this is uh, Ivy Bulldog in 1959, looking back on the 1950s. As 1959 closes, we see the end of yet another decade. How time flies. Looking back, we realize what tremendous changes have taken place in the fighting 50s. Distance counts for so little now that the continents are spanned in a matter of hours by jet planes. Sputniks and Luniks have been put into orbit with abandon. And the nuclear age spells progress or annihilation according to the uses which that knowledge is put. Television too has made it possible for people to be present at all historic occasions. The welfare state, it was said, will solve most of the problems of mankind. And yet we find folk are still beset by all sorts of difficulties. Selfishness, depression, anxiety and disappointment are seen on every hand. So although much has changed, we come back to the truth that human nature changes very little. At least let us say external conditions cannot change it. It can, it can be changed only as it finds harmony with God, its maker. That's not the sort of thing you get in an annual report now, is it, really? Um, we could, yeah. Have I got a few more minutes? Is it? <laughs> just, just a, I'll read you just a couple more, uh, just to uh, whet your appetite. So every year she's got some comment to make uh, about the year. How about this one, 1969? The year when millions of people the world over were able to watch two brave American astronauts walking on the moon's surface 
then rendezvousing in space with their third compatriot. This was a fantastic achievement at which our minds boggle, but let us remind ourselves of countless people working behind the scenes. The historic events highlights the meaning of the biblical phrase, co-workers together. But without that dedicated effort of every single participant, the astounding success of the project might never have been achieved, which in turn reminds us all that in our daily life and living, we too are dependent upon so many people to make our lives happy and well worth living. So often, we take the service of others for granted. They're all rather lovely little homilies, aren't they? Um, and what about this one? This is topical. 1972. The year 1972 has been described somewhere as the end of an epoch and the beginning of an era. This may be so for those who have for centuries thought British and now have to learn to think European. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that, was, that was nearly 50 years ago, uh, how time moves on. Um, yes, let me show you. That's a good idea. Um, so you see there, these are photographs from all the annual reports over the years, over the decades, and you see the same four gradually getting older, um, uh, but still doing the same work. I mean, you just wouldn't imagine, would you, today an organisation where the same people were running it who'd been running it 50 years earlier. Um, and the, eventually the sunbeam and the bell were joined as one. So when they closed the sunbeam, they just used it for other use. And as the years went by, as I say, it became more and more the case that the, those going there were, were residential uh, and convalescence decreased. One thing that I thought was very interesting and struck me, and this also goes back to the project I did with Gill Care, I think we can agree that in every field of health, things have only improved over the decades. You think of cancer survival, you think of um, beta blockers, where, where once high blood pressure was a death sentence, now people are on beta blockers, they, they live for decades. But perhaps one area where things haven't improved, although to link back to what Suzanne was saying about the annex and about the havens with mind, it's coming sort of full circle, because both Gill Care and Southern Convalescent Homes if you were suffering what today we call anxiety or depression, you could just go and stay there and be looked after until you felt better. Um, and you think, well, you have to be in such a severe state of mental health to get into a secure hospital unit. But it sounds like, you know, going back to, to what uh, Gilcare is saying, it's, it's coming back to something that was actually pioneered as long ago as the 1930s. Um, and again, you know, even in recent years, even in the 1990s, uh, groups of people, poor people, poorer people from London, were invited down to stay at the Bell for a week, and they'd be taken out on ex excursions, cream teas, trips to the theatre. Uh, there's a, that's his Peggy Leake's retirement. So you see there's Sister Ivy, Peggy, Irene Chapman. Um, and even when they looked for new trustees, um, one of them was Irene's sister. So it was all kept uh, very close. Um, well, I'm going to end with one more reading. And I think I will go to my other notebook. Um, it has been a remarkable project to be involved with because there is simply so much information. These annual reports uh, have been a gold mine, and all the minute books that all exist and as Leila said, cross-referencing in, in local newspapers and so forth. You have, when you came in, hopefully received a little flyer where you can um, order the book Leila mentioned in advance. And if you order one in advance and pay for it this evening, you get your name for all posterity in the back of the book <laughs> as a subscriber. This was a very popular thing to do uh, in previous years. But people self-published, what they do is they would go around asking people to buy the book in advance and then their names would be put in the back of the book. So we're trying to uh, revive that idea. And I'm trying to find the right page I want in my notes. Um, 
Yes, I thought this this was a this was a this may be a good one to end on. Uh, 1979. The year nationally too has been one of upheaval and new beginnings. History was made in May when, for the first time ever, a woman assumed the office of prime minister. A fact that would have seemed unthinkable a few years ago. Um, <laughs> I think I shall finish with this one, this might be more pertinent. Um, without being controversial, we might wonder at our political system at the moment and where any stability is coming from. Um, and this was a typical piece of Ivy Baldock writing on the occasion of the Queen's Silver Jubilee. Um, this year of Jubilee, what a joy it has been to celebrate the 25 years of our beloved Queen's splendid reign. How proud we have been to share our celebrations with the nations of the Commonwealth. What glorious pageantry and spontaneous jubilation we have seen. The world must surely know our Queen is greatly loved by all her loyal subjects. God bless her and long may she reign. Thank you.